uh, until my first show was over because they didn't think that I could do a show without my brother being there. Wayne Newton, once the dazzling star of Las Vegas, epitomized success with hits that resonated in the hearts of millions. Don't you walk so fast. His magnetic performances, coupled with a multi-instrumentalist prowess, solidified his place as a legend in the entertainment arena. Yet beneath the glitz and glamour lay a tumultuous journey riddled with financial missteps. As the curtains of fame fluctuated, Newton's fortunes took an unexpected descent. This video delves into the intricate tapestry of Wayne Newton's life, tracing his meteoric rise in showbiz, the dreams that transcended music, and the economic quagmires that led to his surprising fall from affluence. Rise to Stardom The lights of Las Vegas have seen many stars grace its horizon, but few shone as brightly as Wayne Newton in his heyday. Born in Norfolk, Virginia, Wayne's journey to stardom began early. With a voice that carried both depth and emotion, Wayne took his first steps into the world of professional singing at the tender age of six. His precocious talent was undeniable, and it wasn't long before he found himself on stages, captivating audiences with his performances. However, the 1960s would prove to be the defining decade for Wayne. Las Vegas, the entertainment capital of the world, was rapidly evolving. Its glamorous casinos and hotels were becoming synonymous with world-class entertainment. As the city blossomed, so did Wayne's career. His entry onto the Las Vegas scene was not just timely, but electric. The neon-lit boulevards and buzzing casinos provided the perfect backdrop for his melodious tunes, and Wayne quickly became one of the most sought-after performers on the circuit. The city, always hungry for fresh talent, embraced him wholeheartedly, and he soon found himself rubbing shoulders with the biggest names in showbiz. During this period, Wayne's discography began to swell with hits that resonated across generations. Songs like Daddy Don't You Walk So Fast and Red Roses for a Blue Lady weren't just chart toppers, they were anthems that etched themselves into the collective consciousness of his fans. These tracks not only established Wayne as a singing sensation, but also showcased his versatility. Can't you hear the song that I'm singing? Can't you hear? Beyond his enchanting voice, Wayne had another trick up his sleeve. His ability to master multiple instruments. Indeed, while most knew Wayne as the voice that serenaded Las Vegas, many were pleasantly surprised to discover his skills as a multi-instrumentalist. The guitar, piano, and banjo were all instruments that Wayne could play with finesse. This rare combination of vocal prowess and instrumental dexterity made him an unparalleled force in the music industry. As the records sold and the concert venues filled, Wayne Newton was not just a name, he was an experience. Fans flocked to his shows, not just to hear him sing, but to witness the magic that happened when he took an instrument into his hands. It was clear that Wayne had carved a niche for himself in the world of entertainment. His performances were not just concerts, they were spectacles, where his voice and instruments wove together to create melodies that lingered long after the curtains fell. Las Vegas, with its shimmering lights and endless nights, had found its prince in Wayne Newton. As the decade progressed, Wayne's reputation grew, and his name became synonymous with the very essence of Las Vegas entertainment. Yet, as the applause grew louder and the accolades piled up, few could have predicted the twists and turns that lay ahead for Wayne Newton. Behind the limelight and standing ovations, a series of challenges and decisions awaited, ones that would test both his character and his resilience. The stage was set, and while the first act had been a roaring success, the subsequent acts of Wayne Newton's life would prove to be equally compelling, if not more. Financial missteps. With the curtains down and the stage lights dimmed, a different narrative played out in Wayne Newton's life, one that sharply contrasted with his stage persona. As the 1980s dawned, so did Wayne's financial tribulations. It was a decade that would profoundly alter the trajectory of his illustrious career, and unfortunately, not in a direction he would have preferred. One might assume that with the consistent success Wayne achieved, financial prosperity would naturally follow. 
However, beneath the veneer of glitz and glamour lay a man who, despite his many talents, had a glaring blind spot when it came to managing his wealth. The business of entertainment is as fickle as it is lucrative, requiring a judicious balance between artistic passion and financial prudence. Wayne, it appeared, leaned heavily towards the former, often sidelining the latter. Wayne's indifferent approach to the business side of his endeavors became increasingly evident. This wasn't just about being lax with finances, it was about a systemic disregard for the fiscal intricacies that his career demanded. His passion for music, while commendable, overshadowed the necessity for sound financial judgment. This oversight often led to him delegating significant financial decisions to those who surrounded him. Entrusting others with one's financial matters is not inherently misguided. However, placing such trust requires an unerring judgment of character. Regrettably, Wayne's judgment was not always on point. Over the years, a series of advisors and confidants entered his inner circle, many with their own agendas, quite divergent from Wayne's best interests. As they say, when money enters the equation, intentions can blur, and for Wayne, this reality hit hard. One of the most glaring manifestations of his fiscal misjudgment was his ambitious endeavor to own the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas. Wayne's aspiration to expand his horizons beyond singing and into the realm of business ownership was commendable. Yet, without a solid grasp of business intricacies and a robust team to guide him, the venture quickly soured. What started as a dream to assert his independence, especially after a long association with Howard Hughes's entertainment company, swiftly devolved into a financial nightmare. By the early 1990s, Wayne's once lavish lifestyle and his towering stature in the entertainment world began to crumble under the weight of mounting debt. Bankruptcy loomed large, and by 1992, Wayne found himself drowning in nearly $20 million of debt. With creditors knocking on his door, including the formidable IRS, the man who once commanded stages with his voice and charisma now faced a chorus of demands for repayments. Wayne Newton's financial decline is a cautionary tale, not just for artists, but for anyone navigating the tumultuous waters of wealth and fame. It underscores the importance of financial literacy and the perils of placing trust indiscriminately. While the bright lights of Las Vegas were kind to Wayne in his prime, the shadows they cast were dark and filled with lessons that would shape the latter part of his life. Ambitions Beyond Music The glow of the Las Vegas Strip wasn't just a beacon for gamblers and revelers, it beckoned dreamers, too. Among those drawn by its luminance was Wayne Newton, whose ambitions stretched well beyond the stages where he serenaded thousands. With a career firmly rooted in the music and entertainment sectors, it would have been easy for Wayne to rest on his laurels. However, a fiery ambition to diversify and assert his independence propelled him into new arenas. One of the most notable ventures that captured Wayne's imagination was his attempt to acquire the Aladdin Hotel. This was more than just a financial decision. It was symbolic of his aspirations to become a business mogul, to transition from the man under the spotlight to the man behind the scenes. Las Vegas was rapidly evolving in the 1980s, with its hotels and casinos standing as titanic symbols of opulence and success. To own a piece of this iconic landscape was to assert dominance, relevance, and enduring legacy. But why the Aladdin? The history of the Aladdin, even before Wayne's involvement, was a roller coaster of fortunes. To Wayne, perhaps, reviving the Aladdin was an opportunity to meld his two worlds entertainment and business, and breathe new life into a classic Las Vegas establishment. The venture, however, was fraught with challenges from the start. Wayne's association with Howard Hughes, the eccentric billionaire, played a pivotal role in this chapter of his life. For years, Wayne's career had been entwined with the Hughes entertainment empire. This association was both a boon and a shackle. While Hughes's patronage had provided him with considerable opportunities and financial backing, it also meant operating under the watchful and sometimes overbearing gaze of the magnate. The purchase of the Aladdin was, in many ways, an act of emancipation, an attempt to step out of Hughes's shadow and carve a unique path. Yet the world of business is not kind to the uninitiated. The complexities of hotel and casino management, combined with the intricacies of Las Vegas's regulatory environment, 
proved to be a formidable challenge. There was also the matter of competition. The 1980s saw a surge in investments in Las Vegas, with many entrepreneurs vying for a slice of the pie. The once glamorous Aladdin, which needed extensive refurbishments and modern upgrades, struggled to compete with newer, flashier establishments. In retrospect, Wayne's foray into sectors beyond music was emblematic of the broader narrative of his life, a tale of ambition, aspiration, and the relentless pursuit of dreams. However, as with many dreamers, the path was not always clear and the journey not always smooth. Wayne Newton, the singer, had conquered stages worldwide. But Wayne, the businessman, discovered that the world of commerce, especially in the shimmering desert mirage of Las Vegas, was an entirely different beast. A beast that required more than just a song to tame. The Sin City Controversies Las Vegas, fondly known as Sin City, has seen its fair share of controversies with its glitzy allure often masking the darker underbellies of the gambling world. For an icon like Wayne Newton, deeply embedded in the fabric of this city, such controversies were never too far away. As his star continued to shine brightly, shadows of alleged ties to organized crime began to form around him, raising questions about the company he kept and the nature of his associations. Central to these controversies was a groundbreaking investigative report by NBC News. In a story that sent shockwaves through the entertainment industry, the news outlet alleged that Wayne had ties to the mafia. For someone of Wayne's stature, such an accusation wasn't merely a dent in his reputation, it threatened the very foundation of his career. The narrative painted by NBC was vivid. A star entertainer in his quest for power and business success in the world's entertainment capital had allegedly made deals with the devil. Wayne's response was swift and assertive. He sued NBC News for libel, adamantly denying any connections to organized crime. This lawsuit wasn't just about clearing his name, it was a battle for his legacy. The courtroom drama that unfolded was as gripping as any Vegas show. High-profile lawyers, testimonies from a range of witnesses, and evidence presented in various capacities ensured that this trial remained under the media spotlight from start to finish. While Wayne emerged victorious in this legal battle, with the jury awarding him a substantial sum in damages, the financial implications of such a prolonged legal skirmish were significant. Lawsuits, especially of this magnitude, are costly. Legal fees coupled with the time and energy diverted away from his core businesses meant that Wayne's financial health took a significant hit. And though the court had ruled in his favor, in the court of public opinion, shadows of doubt lingered. For many of his fans and followers, the very act of association, whether proven or not, was damaging. Las Vegas had always been a town of rumors, and once such whispers take root, they can be challenging to dispel entirely. The trial might have ended, but its ripples were felt long after, affecting bookings, show attendances, and business negotiations. For an entertainer, public image is everything, and Wayne's was now under a cloud of suspicion. The impact of these controversies on Wayne's financial standing and public reputation was undeniable. While he would continue to perform and remain a beloved figure for many, the gleaming veneer of his earlier days was now tinged with shades of gray. Yet, in the face of adversity, Wayne's resilience and determination to set the record straight stood out, a testament to the indomitable spirit of a true Las Vegas legend. The Downward Spiral the bright lights of Las Vegas, while dazzling to many, can also cast some of the harshest shadows. For Wayne Newton, after a series of controversies, missteps, and ambitious endeavors, the inexorable pull of a downward spiral began to manifest. The entertainer, who once ruled the desert city with his unmistakable charm, found himself entangled in a financial web from which escape seemed increasingly elusive. Bankruptcy is a term that strikes fear into the heart of anyone in the world of business and entertainment. It symbolizes not just a monetary loss, but a tarnishing of reputation, a public acknowledgement of failure. For Wayne, the nightmare became a reality when he declared bankruptcy in the early 1990s. The magnitude of his debt was staggering, reportedly standing at over $20 million. How could a performer, who once garnered some of the highest fees in Las Vegas, find himself in such a predicament? 
Contributing to Wayne's financial morass were his skirmishes with the Internal Revenue Service, IRS. The agency claimed he owed millions in back taxes, adding another layer to his financial woes. It's one thing to be in debt to creditors or business partners. It's an entirely different ball game when the U.S. government comes knocking. The IRS is not known for its leniency, and the pressure they can exert is tremendous. Wayne was now not just fighting for his financial stability, but his very way of life. Amidst this backdrop of financial turmoil, Wayne entered into what many would deem an ill-fated partnership with Tony Orlando, another iconic performer. The duo, in an effort to revive their fortunes and perhaps recapture some of the old Vegas magic, opened a theater in Branson, Missouri in 1993. Combining the star power of two entertainment giants in a venue situated in what was becoming America's new entertainment hotspot. However, the reality proved far different. However, this chapter of Wayne Newton's life offers more than just a tale of financial ruin. It's a poignant reflection on the impermanence of fame and fortune and the fragility of success in the entertainment industry. Las Vegas, with all its glitz and glamour, is also a place where fortunes can be made and lost in the blink of an eye, where yesterday's headliner can become today's cautionary tale. Yet, even in his darkest hours, Wayne's spirit and determination remained unbroken. While the downward spiral took its toll, both financially and emotionally, the story of Wayne Newton was far from over. The curtain had not yet drawn on the life and times of one of America's most iconic entertainers. Last Ditch Efforts, Home to Museum. In the ever-ebbing tide of fortune, Wayne Newton's journey had seen him atop glorious peaks and plunged into deep troughs. But as the glimmers of the past dimmed, Wayne, with his characteristic resilience, looked to the future. One last gambit lay on the horizon, transforming his lavish home into a museum. It wasn't just a business endeavor, it was a testament to his legacy, an attempt to seal his place in the annals of entertainment history. Wayne's sprawling estate, known as Casa de Shenandoah, had long been a symbol of his success. Nestled amidst acres of greenery, adorned with opulent architecture, and exuding an aura of grandeur, it stood as a testament to his early successes. However, the vastness of the property, with its maintenance and associated costs, also hinted at his financial miscalculations. Joining hands with CSD LLC, Wayne embarked on a mission to open the gates of his beloved residence to the public. This partnership aimed to convert this personal haven into a tourist attraction. The potential benefits were multifaceted, generating revenue, providing a platform to tell his side of the story, and preserving the heritage of a time when he was an indisputable icon of the Las Vegas entertainment landscape. But converting a personal residence, especially one as lavish and expansive as Casa de Shenandoah, into a public attraction wasn't devoid of challenges. First and foremost were the considerable costs involved. Renovations and restorations had to be undertaken to ensure the property could accommodate daily influxes of visitors. Then there was the challenge of curating the experience, deciding what to showcase, what stories to tell, and how to present the narrative of Wayne's life in an engaging manner. In embarking on this venture, one can't help but draw parallels to another iconic home-turned museum, Graceland, the beloved home of Elvis Presley. Graceland had set a gold standard for such endeavors. Its success wasn't just about showcasing the opulence or presenting mementos from a bygone era. It was about preserving the spirit of Elvis, allowing visitors to connect with the essence of a musical phenomenon. For Wayne and his team, the challenge was twofold. Not only did they have to compete with the allure of Graceland, but they also had to carve a unique niche, ensuring Casa de Shenandoah wasn't just a pale imitation. They aimed to offer an experience that was not merely a walk through an entertainer's former residence, but a journey through the life and times of Wayne Newton, capturing the highs, the lows, and everything in between. The transformation of Casa de Shenandoah from a private home to a public museum stands as one of the most audacious moves in Wayne's later life. It was not just a business strategy. It was a deeply personal endeavor, a last-ditch effort to reclaim and celebrate a legacy that had been overshadowed by controversies and financial missteps. While the shadow of Graceland loomed large, Wayne's estate in its own right became a symbol, 
a testament to the indomitable spirit of an entertainer who, despite all odds, continued to reach for the stars. Animal Kingdom at Wayne's Residence Wayne Newton's journey was never just about the glitz of Las Vegas or the resonant notes of his musical performances. Away from the limelight, one of Wayne's most profound passions was nurturing an array of exotic animals. These creatures, often a mirror to his flamboyant and eccentric persona, added another layer of enigma to his larger-than-life image. The sprawling grounds of Casa de Shenandoah weren't just home to Wayne. They also sheltered an ensemble of animals that one might expect to find in a zoo or a far-flung wildlife reserve. Arabian horses trotted majestically while a variety of birds, including the flamboyant peacock, added color and vibrancy to the estate. Among the most notable residents were penguins and the capuchin monkeys, each living in their bespoke habitats, crafted to resemble their natural homes as closely as possible. But the pinnacle of this animal kingdom was undoubtedly Wayne's collection of rare and exotic birds. He held a particular affection for them, and over time his collection grew, boasting some of the most exquisite and rare species. However, such passion came with a significant price tag. Maintaining an array of such diverse creatures wasn't merely about providing food and shelter. It required creating and maintaining habitats that met each species' specific needs. The financial burden of such upkeep was considerable. Veterinary care, specialized diets, trainers, and handlers to ensure the animal's well-being and safety added to the ongoing expenses. The ponds for the penguins needed to be kept at specific temperatures, the aviaries for the birds had to be spacious and safe, and the stables for the horses required regular upkeep. Additionally, the legal landscape around owning exotic pets was intricate. Licenses and permits were essential, with regular checks ensuring the animals were housed in appropriate conditions and not subject to any form of distress. Wayne had to navigate this complex bureaucratic maze, ensuring every animal was legally acquired and kept within the framework of the law. In the public's eyes, Wayne's animal kingdom was yet another testament to his eccentricities, his desire to live life on his terms. Some saw it as a manifestation of his profound love for creatures, a haven where animals were treated with respect and adoration. Others viewed it as a glaring example of extravagance, a sign that Wayne was out of touch with the realities and responsibilities of owning such animals. It becomes evident that the animals at Casa de Shenandoah were more than mere pets. They were symbols, mirroring the complexities and contradictions of Wayne's own journey. The opulence, the care, the controversies, and the sheer audacity of his choices in this arena reflected the broader tapestry of his life. A life lived in the spotlight, always generating awe, admiration, debate, and at times, stark criticism. Present-day Struggles and Resilience Life has a way of coming full circle. For Wayne Newton, the man who once dominated Las Vegas with his captivating voice and stage presence, recent years have brought their share of trials. Yet, if his past is any indicator, Wayne's spirit remains unbroken, even when faced with insurmountable odds. Financial turmoil continued to be a persistent theme in Wayne's life. Despite the brief interlude provided by the partnership with CSD to transform his beloved home into a museum, the reprieve was fleeting. Even though the museum attracted fans and tourists, eager to take a peek into the life of the legendary singer, operational costs and other overheads made it unsustainable in the long run. With a heavy heart, the doors of the Casa de Shenandoah Museum were eventually closed to the public. Beyond the museum's closure, other challenges lurked. Wayne faced a barrage of lawsuits and property disputes. The once vast and sprawling estate of Casa de Shenandoah, synonymous with his legacy, was at the heart of many of these legal battles. Every court appearance, every headline served as a stark reminder of the vast gulf between Wayne's days of stardom and his present circumstances. But while financial woes were a significant concern, they weren't the only trials Wayne grappled with. Health challenges became an increasing hindrance. Age, coupled with the wear and tear of decades in the entertainment industry, took its toll. His voice, once the centerpiece of his performances, bore the brunt of these challenges. Yet the showman in Wayne refused to be subdued. He underwent surgeries to maintain his vocal prowess, a testament to his unwavering commitment to his craft. And as if personal and financial struggles weren't enough, 
the world was hit with the unprecedented challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic. The entertainment industry, especially live performances, faced a catastrophic downturn. Las Vegas, the city Wayne had once ruled, became a ghost town with theaters, casinos, and hotels shuttering their doors. The tribulations of recent years might have dimmed the brilliance of Wayne's stardom, but they have also highlighted another side of him, a fighter, a survivor. Through every lawsuit, every health scare, and the overarching shadow of the pandemic, Wayne's commitment to his music and his fans never wavered. In the grand tapestry of Wayne Newton's life, these present-day challenges are but another chapter. They showcase a man who, despite the roller coaster of fame, fortune, and setbacks, remains steadfast in his passion. And while the stages may have changed, from the grand theaters of Las Vegas to virtual platforms, Wayne's essence remains unaltered. He is, and will always be, a performer at heart, ever ready to serenade those willing to listen.